Appreciate the music this morning for sure. Appreciate the Holy Spirit being with us, moving in hearts and lives. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus in a personal way, you probably feel pretty uncomfortable right now. And that's all right. I'm just old fashioned and conservative enough to think lost people ought to feel a little uncomfortable in a Baptist church. It's not a bad thing. That means you realize you're kind of out of place. We want to be friendly. We want people to smile at you and shake your hand. But when the Holy Spirit moves, lost people ought to feel a little uncomfortable. And that's all right. The reality is God loves you, loves me, loves the world in spite of our sin. But there was a consequence for our sin. There was judgment for our sin. Jesus took care of that. Place your faith and trust in him for your forgiveness and for salvation. You won't feel so uncomfortable next time you come. I still get a little uncomfortable. I'm wondering, some of these people, Baptist or what? But that's all right. If you have a Bible and a Hope you brought it today. This is a church if you're visiting. I know there's a lot of visitors and I'm grateful for that. I don't take for granted when visitors visit. For whatever reason, we're glad you're here today. This is a church that still preaches the word of God, still believes it's absolutely true. If there's ever a man that stands up here or applies for this job, not that it's open right now, (laughs) that doesn't believe that, stop it. Anybody on staff, anybody teaching our kids who doesn't believe in the inspired word of God, they don't belong here. Um, They probably belong in the church and need to get saved, but they don't need to be in leadership. They won't be in leadership. That's who we are. And we stand unapologetic on that. As the world gets darker and more and more evil, our light should shine brighter. And there's no way to shine any brighter than standing with the truth of God's word. I don't know if you've realized this yet. It's not that popular among the world. And they don't really like to talk about it too much or hear your opinion about it. But I'm glad that I don't have to sing and preach my opinion, though I could write books of my opinions. But I can preach the word of God. And I can't help... But think of, and I hope you don't mind me saying this again, I can't help but this morning when I opened my Bible to John 16 and about to preach in a service like this, in a church like this, with music like this, to think of and pray for our Christian brothers and sisters all over the world who would give anything to be in the position we are today. May we never take this for granted. I'm fighting the flesh not to say a few more things. But I don't want to take away from what God might have to say to us. But it matters where we stand as Americans. It matters. Our borders matter. And I don't mean that in a political way. But we would never, let me back up. There was a day before, a year and a half ago, that I think we would have never allowed another country to line up at our borders and do what we're seeing in another country. And God help us that we would never allow people to lead our country that would be so naive to allow that to happen. But every day, we have thousands pouring into this country who are not just looking for refuge. And it's not just Hispanics, it's not just Mexicans. We have people from all over the world tiptoeing and skipping through our borders who don't have our values. I don't mean our Rowan County Southern values, I mean don't have our American values. And they're here. And we have leadership that is all right with that. But I'm not. So what do we do? Prepare ourselves in a lot of ways. 
Am I safe saying all that and just moving on? Let's stand as we honor God's word, John chapter 16. Last week we were in John 16 and I preached through verses 1 through 7. If you weren't here, buy the cassette. Just kidding. But I want to pick up with verse 8 without reviewing and taking too much time. Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit. Last week we learned or were reminded that he is our comforter. He is our counselor. Jerry just alluded to that a few minutes ago. And today Jesus continues in this text to describe and teach us another role of the Holy Spirit, the comforter. In verse 8 he says, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come... He will reprove the world of sin. That word reprove is convict. The world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Who's me? Jesus. Of righteousness because I, Jesus, am going to my Father and you'll see me no more. And of judgment Because the prince of this world is judged, has been judged, is living under judgment. Would you pray, Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for this place, this church, the leadership, those who have worked through the years so that we can enjoy what we enjoy today. I pray that you will... Help us today to understand your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us, convict us, and lead us in this text today that we won't leave here just here in another sermon and knowing a little more about Scripture, but we would leave here doers of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we... I preached and the title was The Comforter Has Come, and today, with the Comforter in mind, the Holy Spirit, I want to preach a sermon entitled The Conviction of the Comforter. The Conviction of the Comforter. As we learned last week about the comforting, counseling ministry of the Holy Spirit, I trust that we, as Christians, really understand that. We have experienced the comforter because Jesus in John 16 is talking prophetically to his disciples saying the day is coming when I am leaving and the comforter must come. It is necessary, he says, for him to come. In Acts chapter 2, the comforter shows up, the Holy Spirit shows up and manifests his power. But Even when we think of Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost and the power of the Holy Spirit where they spoke in different languages but everyone understood in their own language, or they spoke in a different language and everyone understood in their own language, we see the power of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus, and I won't go back and retrace this, but in the first few verses of verse uh, chapter 16, he's telling his disciples that the day will come when you not only need the, the power of the Holy Spirit to do his work, you need the comforting power of the Holy Spirit because the days are going to get tough. It's going to get hard. I expect there are people outside of North America today who are believers who are experiencing a comforting power of the Holy Spirit like we have never experienced before. And thank God that the comforter came. While I'm there, I have to remind us that the day as Jesus tarries is coming and will come where we will one day experience the comforting power of the Holy Spirit in a way we never have before. I hate to say that because I know it just takes the energy out of the room. And if you could see faces like I'm seeing faces when I say that, you just want to pack up and go home. It's not good news. 
But we can't be so naive as to neglect the reality that this country is swirling down the proverbial toilet. And we are forsaking what our forefathers and even some of our fathers and grandfathers built this country on. And God help us to get the trying to make sure this is a good church word (laughs) to get the antichrist plural out of congress and out of the white house to help turn this around for another reprieve so that we can make it a little while longer say well that sounds a little selfish well i love my kids and your kids and your grandkids And I will love my grandkids, and I want us to do what we can to make sure they don't live in the garbage that's ahead of us if we don't change it. I don't like politics. You're at the wrong place right now, I promise you. (laughs) And if you think that's just politics, you've got some wrong opinions. Jesus said, the day's coming. He told him in verse 6, I'm telling you this now so when it comes, you'll remember that I told you. And then he goes on and says in verse 8, not only is he a comforter, when he comes, he will convict. And for every preacher on the planet, this is a perfect outline text. Three points. They're there. And so I want us to first, as introduction, look at this convicting power of the comforter this conviction and what it really is he tells us in verse 8 when he comes by the way in case anybody's confused he has come he came in acts chapter 2 he demonstrated his power he is among us he is the holy spirit he's here living in us and among us working in us and through us and around us when he comes he will reprove or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. There's your three points. This word convict is an interesting word. Uh, This reprove means to convince or to bring to light. In, in, In the area of salvation, nobody ever gets saved. This is the most deep theological principle you'll hear this morning. Nobody ever gets saved without realizing they're lost. Every person who's ever been truly born again at some point realized that they were dead in their trespasses and sins and needed to be born again. Every person that hasn't realized that has never been born again. What is our job as a believer empowered by the Holy Spirit is to preach and teach and live in a way that brings to light the need for people to be born again. It's our job as a church. That's our mission. That's our purpose is to to create and to live out ministry to where our neighbors on the streets around us all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth can be made aware, brought to light that they are lost and in need of salvation. This is the word convict, to bring to light, to expose While I'm there, I would be not much of a preacher to say that Paul talks about this and uses the same word in 2 Timothy 3.16, where he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's God-breathed, and it's good for doctrine, for reproof. It's used to bring to light, to expose sin. Y'all are acting like it's 1156 instead of 1126. I had to look to make sure. All right. When this book is brought into a room, it starts to expose things. I think immediately of even uh, some of the fights we've had and will continue to have. They're kind of still under the surface right now in even our schools where Bible is being taught. We've got one of our Bible teachers in our school system here uh, who is a member here, teaches in Kannapolis, and we ought to thank God for him and for that ministry, and we support it financially. 
If you're visiting, we support four of those Bible teaching uh, here locally in Kannapolis and South and Northwest and Carson, which thank God Carson now has a new teacher and it's up and running. And um, that teacher needed to be replaced, I can assure you. And so we're supporting them. And I think about the fight and, and the fight turned into this. The fight turned into, um, well, we, we need to be teaching Bible history. And, and there's some, there's some uh, laws and some devils also who are out there trying to stop it still. But that was the way it got changed in the, in the days years ago where, well, we must teach it as Bible history. And we have to have a certain curriculum, you know, to make sure you're not saying too much, right? You just give me that if I'm right. Yeah, good. And, um, and so uh, there were some, some Pharisees in the church, not this church, we don't have any of those, but Pharisees in the church who are like, well, I don't even think we ought to be supporting it anymore because all the teaching is Bible history. It's like, you need to get saved first before you say that. Here's what I believe. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's good for doctrine, which is teaching. It's good for reproof, which is to bring things to light for correction, instruction, and righteousness. This book being opened in a public school brings to light. Don't tell them I said this, but it does the work without the teacher. And that's why the Antichrist want to fight Bibles being in public schools. They know the power of it. And I'll stop there because that will go down another rabbit hole because this has meaning and this has expectations and this has consequences. And unfortunately, most of our public schools now have no consequences for any action. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of three things. He will bring to light. He will expose. This is important. The world. Oftentimes in the New Testament, especially Paul's epistles, he writes and he talks about the world as the world system, the antichrist function of the world, the, the antichrist governmental function, the world system, the way the world does things. That's not this word. This word is the word that almost every Greek um, student knows, cosmos. It's the world. It's the inhabitants of the world. He says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will enlighten he will bring the light he will convict the people in the world the holy spirit's job is not to convict a an antichrist government to be christ-like the holy spirit's job in convicting is to convict the people of the world you and i all nearly seven billion of us on the planet the Holy Spirit will convict the world of what? Here are our three points. Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. First, in verse 9, we see the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin. Notice sin here is not sin plural. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is teaching a specific Sin that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of. It's not like, well, everyone has sinned and God's going to convict everybody of sin, plural. This is a specific teaching by Jesus that the Holy Spirit will convict of singular a sin. What sin? The sin is the refusal to believe in the Son of God. This is important to understand. I have heard in my years of life and ministry, people argue over some of the silliest, non-biblical, maybe they think biblical things. And unfortunately, the unpardonable sin has been one of those. When I just said that word or those words, people looked up for the first time in the last 15 minutes. I promise you it happened. You want me to point? No. <laughs> Unpardonable sin. What is that? Because people perk up because there's been a lot of discussion about that for centuries. I'm not here. My message is not entitled the unpardonable sin. And what is it? And how do you commit it? Or how do you get out of it? But I am here. And really quickly, I'll tell you, it's very simple. 
Jesus here is referring to what I believe the Bible teaches as the only sin that is unpardonable, unforgivable. And it's, we hear the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And we're like, what is that? Ask a, ask a 12-year-old what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is and see if they can respond, if they haven't been in church or if they maybe have been in church. It is the rejection of the convicting of the Holy Spirit that God's Son is Jesus. Now, not going to cause any disrup- disruption. If you disagree with what I'm about to say, it's going to be short and sweet. You can disagree, write, call, email, text, um, take me to lunch, whatever. I am convinced through the scriptures, and I can sleep well at night with this belief that the unpardonable sin or this one sin that is unforgivable, which is rejection of the belief that Jesus is the Son of God, can only happen once you've taken your last breath. Now, you may disagree, and that's all right. But I believe that God's grace is sufficient even until the person's last breath. Who would I be? Who would I think I am to tell somebody that somebody's son, daughter, mom, dad, grandparent is lost and never got saved when I don't know what took place in their final hours between them, the Holy Spirit, and God? Now, at the same note, you know me well enough, I think you know, I'm not getting up and preaching somebody into heaven. I'm not getting up and giving some false hope that somebody that's acted like the pure devil all their life is, you know, shagging on streets of gold. I'm not, I don't play that game. By the way, that's to come, but I won't get into the eschatology of it. I've heard more people kicking up gold dust. <sighs> and the Bible would fix there. Anyway, this sin is the sin of refusing to believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. This is important for us to understand because the Holy Spirit's role here is to convict or to expose a person's unbelief of that sin, that sin of unbelief. Now, as a Christian, and there's a lot of Christians most likely here today, and and there is a conviction of the Holy Spirit when we sin, that that's not this sin that Jesus is talking about. The Holy Spirit will come and convict them of their unbelief. The Holy Spirit convicts man in this text of the sin of unbelief. Why is that important? Well, I'm glad you asked because it's extremely important because there's a lot of people on their way to not heaven (laughs) who know they have sinned, plural. They might not call it sin, but they know they've done wrong. God has given us a conscience to know right from wrong. But as believers, we have the Holy Spirit to also know right from wrong. And it is illuminated. The Holy Spirit illuminates the word of God to expose our sin as well. That's a different sermon for a different day. This is the sin of unbelief. So even as a 10-year-old boy, or you name your age, or whenever you got saved, if you're saved, and it's a good time to take notes on this right now, because this is life or death. This is eternal life or eternal death that Jesus is talking about. When I was a 10-year-old boy on a Wednesday night going to RAs, Royal Ambassadors, to ride my bike and play and goof off and eat a, a cool moon slushy. Those were the good old days. Let's just all think about the good old days. <laughs> we had a cheer wine machine. Bobby knows these days. Had the chocolate brownie in it. It had the cool moon in it. Anybody remember those days? You, that looks like a Yankee row or something. They don't know what they're like. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. If you never had a chocolate brownie, you've never lived. And these kids today. Mm. Anyway. That's why I went. Now, I, I like to say I'm a, I was a pretty good kid. All my brothers and my cousin that moved in with us, they were all juvenile delinquents. I look like Billy Graham compared to all of them. But I knew I was still sinful. There was, I knew I had done a few wrong things. But that night, God didn't, through the Holy Spirit, convict me 
of just those wrong things I had done. A person, listen, this is important. I hope this doesn't change your theology unless it does for the better. A person doesn't get saved because they realize they've stole bubble gum from the grocery store. Or there's a lady probably watching this morning that I stole change off of her table when she used to watch me. And I stole a pocket full of change. I didn't think it was stealing. It, I'd been there several days and nobody was using it. So I thought <laughs> it would be good. And so we were at Kmart and I was just loading up on the quarter machines. I mean, I was coming back with stuff and I asked my mom, she was trying to say, hey, you want something? I said, where'd you get the money for that? And that was the end of that. And um, <laughs> I had a piggy bank and it got broken. And I had to break all the change back to that lady and say, hey, I stole from you. I'm a sinner. It wasn't that on that Wednesday night that God told me, you're a sinner. You stole change off of her table. Just play along with me. What led me to get saved? Listen, here's the point. This is what we all need to understand. If you were a 10-year-old who knew you sold change off of your babysitter's table, you knew you were wicked. You knew that was wrong. If you smacked your sister or brother because they looked at you funny, you knew that was wrong. <laughs> but that night, what the Holy Spirit convicted me of that led to my salvation was that I had committed the sin of rejecting Jesus as Savior and the payment for all of my sins. And until a person comes to that realization, listen, there's a lot of people filling churches every Sunday who know they're a sinner. They can look at their spouse and get confirmation. <laughs> but until they know they have sinned the sin, which by the way, just to put it in perspective, every person that's never accepted Christ is living the sin. There are people in this room who will leave this place today still living the sin of unbelief. They'll walk out knowing they've sinned, knowing they're a dirty old rascal. I was reading how J. Vernon McGee, and he used rascal all the time, like that was a bad word. Um, I mean, kids used to watch the little rascals, and that didn't, but rascal, and I think that was almost like church cussing for him. People will leave today of churches all over the country knowing that they're a sinner, knowing they've done wrong. But may you not leave today knowing that you've committed the sin of neglecting that Jesus is Lord. He paid the price for all of your sins. And that if you place your faith and trust in him as the payment for your sin, and him alone. Until you do that, you're lost. A lot of people stand before God knowing that they were a sinner. But until you believe on Jesus, listen to what Jesus said in John 8. I forgot I actually had verses for this. This helps. He said to them in John 8, 23, you are from beneath. He's talking to the religious folks, the Pharisees. You are from beneath. I am from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Oh, I thought, I, I thought you just had that opinion, pastor. No, Jesus said it. I stole it from him. These things, 1 John 5 have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God? Remember, Paul and Silas were in jail in the middle of the night. Not much reason to be happy, but they sang with all their might. Remember, you remember the jailer? That was my first solo at Central Baptist, by the way. I, it was a, the single went platinum. Anyway, <laughs> the prepubescent high tenor Dean Hunter. Anyway, so Paul and Silas, they broke free, and the jailer said, What? What must I do to be saved? Y'all ever heard that before? That's an ax. What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, and Silas said, we're going to sing three verses. If you come down front, join the church. We're going to keep singing 
until you do it. Their answer was, to what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Not believe that he walked around, that believe on him, believe in him, that he is who he said he was, that he did what he said he was going to do, and that he ascended back to the Father. Believe on him for your salvation and you shall be saved. This is important to understand, and the church is full of people that know John 3, 16, but have no clue about John 3, 17 and 18. We all know God loved the world. We all know he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him, that word believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, verse 17 kind of goes along with verse 16. That's why it's after it. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not, this is important, is condemned already. By the way, this verse... If, you, if you're studying scripture and we're in John chapter 16, you can roll over to John 3 and just kind of parallel it. Same Jesus teaching same principles. By the way, point three, which is in the text already, you already know the sermon outline, that he came to convict the world of judgment. It's, it's number three. We're only on number one and it's 1144. I got it. But Judgment. He came to convict the world of judgment. That don't make any sense unless you know John 3, 16, 17, and 18. You're condemned already. The world has been judged already. So he came, the Holy Spirit, to convict the world of sin. And then he also, in verse 10, we see that he came to convict the world of righteousness. This is great. We'll spend some more time on this, and then we'll breeze through the last point because I just helped you out. He will convict of righteousness, verse 10, because I go to my father and you see me no more. I don't like to think I'm brilliant most days of the week, but if I read that, somebody should have chuckled unless you really think I'm brilliant and know that I know I'm brilliant. When I read that, thank you. When I read that, I'm like, what? The Holy Spirit's going to convict the world of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. And maybe you're just more advanced than I am and and you've studied a lot more, but I had to study to get this. Jesus is about to leave, which is why he said the comforter will come. It's necessary for me to leave in chapter 16 because if I leave the comforter, by the way, I didn't want to say this last week because I know some people would be like, I don't know if I believe that, but I read behind some people smarter than me. I think they're dead. So I'll say they are. And they said what I wouldn't say last week. And what they said, and you can take it if you believe it or not, uh, it's hard to, hard to imagine, but when Jesus said, I'm going away and it's necessary for me to go away so that the Holy Spirit will come, what I was thinking, but I wouldn't say it because I hadn't read it, and I can blame it on somebody else, was the Holy Spirit was better for us than Jesus. Whoa, whoa. Now I don't want to get into, see, that's why I thought, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's better than Jesus. I didn't say that. It's the Trinity. First, second, third person of the Godhead. They're equal, yet coexistent. Covered that last week. And everybody's crystal clear on how that works. Remember, it's like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a boiled egg. For those of you visiting, looking at me like I'm a lunatic, watch last week, I explained. He's not any of those or like any of those. But Jesus said, it is necessary that I go so that he can come. And I can imagine those disciples just like us. We said, no, don't leave us. There can't be anything better than you. He said, no, I got to so that you can experience the Holy Spirit. Listen, God knows what's best for us. And if Jesus being here would have been better for us than the Holy Spirit, he would have stayed here. But he left so that he could come to us. Baptist, not so we could be afraid of talking about him, but so that we could embrace his ministry and live in it and appreciate it and experience him. I shouldn't have said it, him. But we've been scared away. We don't need to be afraid 
anymore. Yeah, we saw something last week, and we see some, still some similar things today in different churches. And here's what, here's what I do. Um, I'm just dumb enough to say, you know what? Let them have it if they want to. This is what, I'm gonna, this is what I believe Scripture teaches without it affecting me. When I go to the buffet, I leave all the vegetables for y'all. <laughs> I'll take care of the proteins. Y'all can have all the green stuff. And it's the same way. It's how we got, we've got to be safe as believers and not let someone's misinterpretation or even false theology affect scriptural biblical teaching about the Holy Spirit and cause us to not benefit from him. Convict the world of righteousness. How does he do that? Jesus was the personification, you used that word since middle school, the embodiment of righteousness. Right. right standing before God, perfect, holy, blameless. He was justification, he, he was righteousness in the flesh. Jesus ascended to the Father So now there's no more embodiment. This is going to hurt some of your feelings. Now there's no longer an embodiment of righteousness on the planet. Anybody offended? Well, I thought I was it. There's no more model to look at in the flesh because Jesus was it. He was him. And he left. While he was on earth, walking and talking and teaching and healing and doing good to all people, he was the picture of righteousness. The picture's gone. So the Holy Spirit's job, his role, is to convict the world of righteousness. How does he do that when the picture is gone? Now we're following, right? I see you. Yeah, how do we do that? And here's where we get our feelings hurt even more. Because the Holy Spirit convicts us of our unrighteousness. Of our, more specifically, Jesus had a good time with this, self-righteousness. Now, I say he had a good time. That sounds like he might have enjoyed it. I don't know. I don't think he did because he didn't sin. And that would probably be a sin if I enjoyed talking down to people like kind of he did. But he's God and he didn't sin. Amen. And so we move on. But listen to what he said to some. I don't have all the verses here, but this, this sounds good. People in Baptist church would love for the preacher to get up and say this about them. You bunch of whitewashed tombs. You're clean on the outside. You're a pretty mahogany coffin. But on the inside, you stink like dead men's bones. Amen, preacher. That's what he said to those Jews, Jewish leaders who thought their self-righteousness was enough to get them to heaven. You brood of vipers. You pit of snakes. You, you close up the door to heaven. I mean, he forgot the first part. It just made everybody happy and the crowd went wild. You're not going to heaven and you close up the door so nobody else goes to heaven. Did he say that? Yeah. Who is he talking to? Any person today who claims self-righteousness, that I'm good enough to deserve anything from God, much less salvation. So the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of righteousness by convicting us and showing us, remember convict, exposing us of our own unrighteousness. I think Paul I think there's a verse in Romans that says something that maybe you've heard before. There's none righteous. No, not one. Nobody? Nope. There was only one, and he's gone. And now the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world that there's no more righteousness. And he does that by showing us our self-righteousness, our unrighteousness. And I'm going to tell you what exposes unrighteousness more than anything. Is this. I could get up and I could preach hard and I could call out sins and 
make everybody feel bad, myself feel bad, but act like I'm not feeling bad. And it not do a thing to make somebody feel bad. Maybe. By the way, the psychology of that is the only people that will feel bad about me trying to make them feel bad is people that respected me enough, in my opinion, to make them feel bad. Which for a Baptist pastor is not the majority usually. But this church is different for you visitors. It's 82%. I'm just kidding. We poll. He illuminates, the Holy Spirit illuminates our eyes to true righteousness. To show us who Jesus is and to show us who we are. In John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. See where I was just at a second ago? And this is the condemnation that has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does. Now this is Jesus speaking. For everyone that doeth evil hates the light. Neither comes to the light. Listen. Lest his deeds should be Reproved, convicted. When a Christian that really loves Jesus and not ashamed of the gospel walks into a room and there's a conversation and he or she starts talking about what the Bible says about righteousness and unrighteousness and heaven and hell, it gets uncomfortable. Why? People start to leave. Why? This this might intrigue some of you, and you might be disgusted by it. When I grew up, we were poor. That's poor. We're so poor, we didn't have the O and the R, right? (laughs) So we were poor. Made us stronger. Made me not afraid of roaches. See see how that, you say that word, and people are like, oh, roaches? I've never been around one. I married one of those. That's the difference. (laughs) She was blessed to grow up in a house without a roach. Okay, we'll leave it there. But I remember, y'all going to appreciate this. This is all you're going to remember about the whole sermon. I remember going in the house and opening up a drawer and roaches scurrying. Why? Because they were exposed. Because they like darkness. I'm told. I wrote a paper on it in fourth grade on roaches. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Figured I was one with the roaches. I thought I'd write a paper. No, no, I can remember opening like, whoa, roaches everywhere. And they're running everywhere because they don't come out. I was like, hey, hit me with the bug spray. (laughs) Because light exposes darkness. Light exposes our sin. And Jesus was the light of the world. And when he showed up, people ran. People either ran away because they saw themselves or they ran to him because they saw themselves. And today... When we leave in just a few minutes, I trust, trust me, it's going to happen. There'll be people who leave today running away from his exposure, and there'll be people that run to him. Yeah. Only two. No in between. He'll convict, convince the world of righteousness. I was reading behind somebody. I read behind a lot. If I quote them, I'll quote them, but this was not a quote necessarily, but they were talking about how we sometimes compare ourselves. By the way, that's, that's one of the most unhealthy things we can ever do is compare ourselves to somebody else in any capacity. Our kids do it, right? Um, you made an 89? Yeah, but everybody else made an 80. Are you everybody else? I'm not everybody else's parents. I've had that discussion, probably something like that. If you compare yourself to every other person in the class and you're better than them, so what? They might all be idiots. How about in life in general? Listen, I'm I'm better than him. They don't even go to church on Wednesdays. Oh, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Turned off. It's all right. I don't get mad about it. You got problems. You got situations. You got things to do. I understand. I just threw that out. It's probably of the devil. Or, you know what? We... They don't go on, or they don't give like I give. I don't know how you know unless you talk about what you give and what they give. He doesn't dress up for church. I'm just meddling now, just playing around. My mind's rolling around. We start compare ourselves to other people. And I was reading behind some people, and more than one person said this, and it was older, so they were talking about people like Hitler, and Stalin, 
And then I threw in, because I live in today, Putin. And these Russian dictators and these authoritarian dictators of the universe. And we see people, I mean, when you see some of the stuff that's happening on our screen now, and then you think about what happened with Hitler, you think about what happened with uh, Stalin and some of these other guys. Who would we be to compare ourselves to Stalin or to Hitler? I'm better than him. Listen, I hope you are. But spiritually speaking, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and Jesus said to convict the world of their unrighteousness. Who are we to, com- to compare ourselves to people that we know are bad people? And guess what? There's none righteous. No, not one. Listen, I know this is kind of, it's kind of like, well, that's not apples to apples. It is apples to apples spiritually. Because a lost person is lost whether they're Stalin or Dean Hunter. A lost person is lost and headed for hell if they're Vladimir Putin or your name. Because there's none righteous. No, not one. And if we try to compare ourselves to the spiritual levels of other people as if it's going to get us a front row seat to heaven, we've missed it because the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of our unrighteousness and his righteousness. And my Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 21 that he who knew no sin, the only righteous one became sin for me so that me unrighteous might be made known the righteousness of God. The only way I become righteous is through him. The only way you become or became righteous, it's close, it's 1159, I need to amen this so you know that it's true. The only way you become righteous is through his righteousness. Nothing you can do, nothing I can do, no perfect attendance, no three-piece suit, no cut your hair a certain way, no, no cussing, no church, whatever, memorize 4,000 scriptures. Nothing. If a person doesn't get saved by placing their faith and trust in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, they will spend eternity in the same hell as a Hitler. That's not fair. I'm not as bad as him, but you're not as good as him. And the only way we get to heaven is through his righteousness. Would you stand with me? Oh, but there's one more point. Yeah, but you're done. The conviction of judgment. He will come to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And because I'm done and you're done, listen. The world has been judged for their sin. John, Jesus said in John 3, you're condemned already. If you don't believe, you're condemned already. The world's been condemned Sin entered into the world, Adam and Eve, and by sin, death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. The world's been condemned. We live in a judged world. I got to say this because it's in the point there. In verse number whatever, 11, he refers to the... Jesus told some of them, your father, the devil. I won't say that. But he says judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. The prince of this world is Satan. I've got references if you need them. Satan has been judged already. He knows his place. But unfortunately for us, but in God's providence and his sovereignty, he's allowed Satan, Lucifer, his chief angel, because of his selfishness and his pride chose to rebel against God and he has a posse with him that followed him out of there and he has rule over this land universal question why do bad things happen if God loved the world why does he let this stuff happen God does love the world but Satan is the prince of this world and sin is still prevalent in this world But Satan's been judged. Scripture says when Jesus died on the cross, 
In so much words, Satan thought, it's over, I've done my job. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead victorious through the power of God. And Satan was judged. He was sentenced to the lake of fire. Oh, now we're getting into Revelation. Yeah, I got that there too. But until then, he's roaming the earth. And he's in charge. Now, he's not in charge, but he's the prince of this earth. And he's been judged. You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit convicts us, exposes this reality that Satan is judged. His authority here, though it seems like things are out of control, is limited authority for a limited time. But while we're still here, and while he's roaming around causing chaos and confusion, there's still time, there's still grace, there's still mercy for the world who the Holy Spirit is convicting of the sin and exposing their unrighteousness. There's still time for them to accept Christ. Not in my notes, but it's in reality. Time's running out. Church, we can't look around and act like we don't see what's happening. Time's running out. Either Jesus is coming back, which he is at some point, and all this is going to come to pass, or your time's going to run out. And today's the day of salvation. The Holy Spirit is alive and well. He is here. He's living and active in the hearts of Christians in the life of believers. He's here convicting people of the sin. He's here convicting and exposing people of their unrighteousness and his righteousness. Maybe maybe you came in today a little distraught and discouraged thinking, oh man, everything's just going to hell in a handbasket. You're right, it kind of is because the, the owner of hell, kind of. The occupant of hell is running things. But time's running out. Did you pray with me? If you're here today and you're lost and you know it, God's revealed it to you, you're unrighteous. There's only one righteous. And the Bible says there's none. And today might be the day you need to call on him. Believe on the name of the Lord and be saved like that Philippian jailer. What does it mean to believe? Well, the Bible says the devil believes and fears and trembles. No, it's to put your faith. It's to commit to him as Lord of your life. You don't need to tell God or yourself or your neighbor that you believe in Jesus. So what? No, you commit to him your life. And you drop your nets as the fishermen did in Matthew and Luke. And you go follow him with everything you are. That's being born again. If you're here today and you know you've never made that decision, it's time to do it. If you're a believer here today, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Convicts us, who comforts us, showed us that we were lost, revealed to us we were unrighteous. And still today, which is another sermon for another day, tells us when we're doing wrong and comforts us with his grace and mercy. Father, we thank you for your word. It's certainly been clear. Though we sometimes don't understand it, and though sometimes it's difficult to swallow, you've taught us the truth about our personal life, about our decisions in life, about our spiritual decisions in life. And I'd be an utter fool today to believe that there are people in this room, that all the people in this room and everybody watching was a born-again, devout, committed Christian. God, as Jerry just reminded us, this, this church and many other churches have lost church members on the road. And I pray today if your Holy Spirit has convicted hearts of their sin of unbelief, convicted them of their unrighteousness, and that the only way to be righteous is to trust in your righteousness, the righteousness of your Son, Jesus. I pray today would be the day that they do it. For us believers, 
continue to remind us of your grace and your mercy and to be grateful. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. As we